everyone so far we have been discussing the fundamentals of nuclear chemistry and then some of the analytical techniques based on nuclear phenomena and also the radiochemical techniques today lecture i will describe some of the applications of radioisotopes in societal applications in the service of mankind like healthcare industry and so on so before going to the actual applications let me explain what are the fundamental principles underlying these radioisotope applications so there are mainly three concepts or three properties of these radiations that enable them to be useful in many many fields so i'll just explain them the first one is the radio tracer concept i had also explained it earlier in one of the lectures on radio tracer based analytical techniques and the underlying principle is that the radio isotopes have the same chemical properties as their stable isotopes so this property of radio isotopes helps them to trace the path of their stable isotopes you take any industry or even a chemical reaction where you want to understand the mechanism of the chemical reaction then you can label one of the atoms with the radioactive atoms and see how this particular reagent is moving in the chemical system like sulfur you know sulfur containing chemicals their reactions can be studied by sulfur 35 labeled compounds in fact many of the reaction mechanisms have been understood using radio radio tracers radio isotope labeled compounds so we will discuss that applications in many many areas second property of this radiations is that this radio isotopes emit radiations that are highly penetrating and because of that high penetration power you will find many many applications of radio isotopes in industry like radiography or even you know in the no non destructive testing investigations you, you will see there many of them so this is the main concept they can penetrate through thick absorbers like what i have shown here is that alpha particles will travel this way like if we have a do a transmission experiment then i by i0 will follow four alpha particles they will travel same distance and after that there will be certain fall that is the typical transmission graph for alpha particles whereas the gamma ray radiation will follow exponential decay so the like in beer lambert law so you can use make use of this intensity decrease with thickness of absorber in many many applications and the third is the effects of radiation now radius ionic radiation can effect can create defects they can generate free radicals they can produce heat they can even kill pathogens and the, they can damage the cells and these properties of this radiations find them very useful in med medicine for example in uh, cancer treatment therapy of cancer and also modifying materials by polymer like polymerization or you can create defects in materials like diamonds you know you can create the different colors in diamonds and add to their value they produce heat they can you can use them as a source of heat like 238 plutonium is used in satellites as a source of heat so you can power like pacemakers then they can kill pathogens so that this is utilized in nos in food technology you can prevent the sprouting of the fruits and many many applications they can even induce mutations in seeds and you can produce improved varieties of crops by using radiation induced mutation so the list is endless and i will cover some of the examples of these three concepts in my talk okay so first let me in this particular uh, talk discuss the applications of radio isotopes in healthcare and this applications could be based on radio tracer concept or they could be based on the radiation effects on uh, in the human body so all sort of applications can come 
So in radio uh, isotope applications healthcare, one of them is in vitro. That means in the test tube, in the laboratory, you can do analytical determinations of the different biological components of our human blood or many other you know, biofluids you can determine. For example, we discussed in the radio analytical techniques, the radio immunoassay, where you can determine the concentration of T3, T4, TSH, or even other uh, like prostate specific antigens you can determine by, by using labeled antigens and interacting them with antibodies and then finding out the concentration of these molecules at very, very low levels like nanomolar concentrations. But they are done in the laboratory. In vivo, in the body, if you introduce certain radioisotopes, then you can do investigations of diseases and the chemicals that are introduced in the, in the body in vivo, they are called radio pharmaceuticals. They are like medicines, they are pharmaceutical compounds, but they are labeled with the radioisotopes. So we'll discuss them in this lecture. And also the radioisotopes by virtue of their radiation effects, by virtue of killing the tumor cells, we can use them in therapy. And lastly, the sterilization of medical products. These medical products, you know, when they are implements, the tools, the, uh, the, the seizures, the tweezers, and different implements used in operations. So they have a chance of getting, you know, in, in effect, infected again during handling. So in this particular case, what happens? You can pack them, you can pack them in a cardboard boxes, take them to the plant for irradiation. And after irradiation, they will be opened only when they are being used for the operation. So you can sterilize the medical products, implements, tools by using radiation. So I will not discuss this much in this particular talk, but I will talk about other first three. First two, diagnosis and the therapy. Okay. So now let us discuss what are radio pharmaceuticals. So radio pharmaceuticals are at pharmaceutical compounds, but they are labeled with radioisotopes. So a special radiochemical formulation, the formulation is a radiochemical, it's a compound of adequate purity. So it should have a desired radiochemical purity, radionucleidic purity, that is what we mean by adequate purity and pharmaceutical safety. So there are pharmacopoeia for different their quality control measures to be taken with regard to its pH, sterility and so on, pyrogenicity. So it should be suitable for oral or intravenous administration to humans for performing a diagnostic test or for treatment. So any, any you know, um, compound to be injected intravenously or orally in the human body has to pass the tests of this, this kind of quality control measures. So the pharmaceutical safety, important so that we will discuss in my talk. So this is a general definition of a radio pharmaceutical. Now the radio pharmaceutical can be used in diagnostics, diagnosis of diseases wherein we image, we take the image of an organ, it could be static or we can see the dynamic flow of the body fluid like the blood. Then we can get the dynamic image of an organ, how the metabolism is taking place in the human organ. So that you can do using diagnostic applications where you inject the radioisotope labeled magic compound and then in the body wherever this radioisotope is going that particular organ we can do they take the image in static or in a dynamic or you can have sequential images so this is another application and then we have the therapeutic applications where you can do you can use radionuclide externally it's called teletherapy. From outside, you can expose the cancerous tissues and kill them, or we can introduce the radioisotope in the body either by a sealed source in a cavity or by using a radioisotope labeled compounds. So, these radioisotopes essentially are emitting if those which are introduced in the human body in the form of a compound, like radio pharmaceuticals, they have to have particulate emission like beta plus or alpha, beta minus or alpha so that they can do the damage to the cancerous tissues. So in, in radiopharmaceuticals, if you inject into the human body, then they are required to have particulate emission, beta, alpha, so that they can kill the tissues in their nearby vicinity. So that is the kind of requirement we have for radiopharmaceutical in therapy. Okay, so let us see for diagnosis, 
diagnostic applications, what are the kinds of radioisotopes we can choose for diagnosis as a response. So one of them is the decay mode. The decay mode, see what we are doing, we are going to take the image of the organ in which the gamma, the radioisotope is distributed. So it should preferably emit only gamma ray. So it should not be emitting a particulate because that particulate will unnecessarily damage the tissue. So there are not many radioisotopes which will be not emitting particulate because the gamma is emitted only after beta or alpha decay. So, but there are like internal transitions. The isomeric state is there at like technetium 99 m. It will decay by only internal transition. So 140 kV is a gamma ray and having half-life of 6 hours. That is an ideal for diagnostic pharmaceutical. First is that it should not emit preferably any particulate emission. The second is that the energy of the gamma ray should be in the range of 100 to 200 kV. Why? Because if it is below the 100 kV energy, then it will be stopped in the body itself. It will not come out of the body. And if it is more than 200 kV, then the efficiency of detection will be low. So 100 to 200 kV is the optimum range of gamma energy for a good image. That is the reason why gamma energy should be in 100 to 200 kV. More than 200, efficiency will go down. Less than 100, the gamma ray will not come out of the body. It will be attenuated by the human body. Half life should be short, preferably few hours. Again, the reason why it is so because you don't want the radioisotope to be in the body after the image has been taken. So it should come out of the body or it should die down in the body itself. So that few hours time is optimum for the diagnostic investigation. And lastly, it should have a versatile chemistry. That means it should be able to complex different ligands and it should those ligands having high affinity to different organs. So a, a particular metal ion in much different oxygen state will be ideal because different ligands may bind a metal ion in different oxygen state. So some of the examples of these radioisotopes that are used in diagnosis are technetium 99 m ideal. In fact, it is called the workhorse of nuclear medicine. About 80% of the nuclear medicine investigations for diagnosis are done using technetium 99 m So gamma ray is ideal, half-life is ideal. Indium 111, ideal, ideal gamma ray energy, but half life is little long. 123 iodine, half life is and gamma ray wise ideal. That is why there is huge demand for 123 iodine, though it requires a genome target, enriched genome. Helium 201, you can see half life and gamma energies are quite good. Gallium 67, 3.26 days and good. And iodine 131, though the half life is long, in, you will find in many applications it is very very useful because it can be used in both diagnosis and therapy. It has the gamma ray energy, it has the particulate emission also. Now, once you label a compound and prepare the pharmaceutical, there are certain pharmaceutical quality control measures you must establish. And this they belong to the physical chemical control, radiochemical control and biological control. In physical chemical properties, you should inspect the solution that it should be clear, there should not be any turbidity. pH should be the proper zone which will be compatible with the body. The chemical purity of the compound, there should not be any other impurities. And sometimes you use in the particulate form, like, you know, some, some microspheres are used for some treatment, so the particle size should be in the proper range. The radiochemical control in regards to radioactive concentration, what is the concentration of radioisotope is millicurie or microcurie or curie. So, you know, depending upon the requirement specified by the doctor, doctor nuclear medicine personnel, you should specify that concentration. Radionucleidic purity, there should be no unwanted radioisotopes and the radiochemical purity, the chemical form of that molecule should be whatever is the desired one. For example, if you have Fluorine in fluorine FDG, then FDG should be only, there should not be any other derivative of FDG. So that kind of purity has to be established. So there are measures to specify to determine the radiochemical purity by that thin layer chromatography or PPA chromatography, radionuclear purity by gamma spectrometry, radioactive concentration by counting the sample. Then you have the biological control, sterility for injectables, you have to have it should be sterile, it should be the pyrogenicity means it should not produce heat in the body 
So this is an important requirement of the pharmaceutical and it should be distributing in the organ of your interest. So these are the properties that the pharmaceutical should have. Okay, so uh, I have just give you a, given you a figure that whatever different organs in the body which are likely to get affected by a disease, then there are radiopharmaceuticals both in terms of the radioisotopes as well as the molecule which for which the, there has been already there in development to produce those kind of pharmaceuticals which will be selectively going to the particular organ. For example, if you want to see the glucose metabolism in the brain, then you have fluorine 18 labeled FDG. If you want to see the thyroid uptake, thyroid functioning, if whether there is any malfunctioning of thyroid, you can do sodium iodide labeled with 131 iodine or even you can do technetium 99M because technetium also can go to thyroid. Then for heart, you have F F18, FDG and there are there is one thallium also. Thallium 201 also will go to heart, so you can do for stress test. Then for bones, you have the you have ethylene, diamine, tetramethylene, phosphinic acid, sulfur, samarium labeled EGTMP, or you can have phosphorus labeled orthophosphate. Again, for uh, uh, the bones, you have volumium 166 hydroxy appetite. So, in fact, there are some of the few you will find that, for example, for the prostate, there are prostate specific antigens. So, if you label that antigen with a particular compound like lutetium, it will selectively go to prostate and you can do the image as well as you can do the treatment of the prostate cancer. So, for every organ, almost every organ in the human body, you will find there is a particular pharmaceutical and if there is a proper labeling radioisotope. So, you can do imaging of different organs of the body. Now, what are the experimental techniques for this? You have this technique called for imaging scintigraphy and it is also called the single photon emission computer tomography SPECT. So the, the principle of SPECT is that suppose you have the organ which is containing the radioisotope here and this organ is now in the human body, it is emitting gamma radiations isotopically. So you from outside, this is the machine for SPECT. So the camera, this is the camera, you, the patient is made to lie on this and the camera will detect the gamma ray coming out from the organ. Now the, the, the radioisotopes and emitting gamma ray in all directions, but you have detected only one side and you want to take the spatial image. So as a function of, as a sp in space, how the organ is distributed, that means how the activity is distributed in the organ. So you have a detector where the gamma ray is made to pass, go to the detector through collimators. So, it will go at a particular angle so that tell you in which bin this gamma ray has come. So, you can, this is a segmented kind of uh, system. So, this collimation helps you finding out the, at the place at the, from which the gamma ray has come. Then the, the gamma rays are detected by the detector, mostly scintillated sodium iodide, thallium or BGO type of scintillators. And there are PMT photomultiplier tubes to take, convert the signal the photons converted into electrons at a PMT and then there is a position sensitive position sensitive circuit to identify from which place in the organ the particular gamma ray has come. Like for example, this, this collimation will give you this particular position. That, so, we can see in organ and you can construct the image by help of a computer. So, that is the principle behind the spect. So, it essentially gives you the 3D image of the organ in static or in dynamic mode. Like this is just to give an example, expect images like for this technetium 99M labeled a MIB, it is called MIB, methoxy isobutyl isonitrile and it is a heart imaging agent. You inject intravenously this technetium 99 MIB and after 15 minutes you take the image of the heart of the person from outside. Externally, you are non-invasively, you are monitoring the gamma rays that is coming out of the human body and you can see as a function of time, how the, the, when the heart is pumping the blood, you can see the different images, different cross sections of the heart and if a particular portion has got infructuous, that means if the blood is not reaching there, the muscles are dead, you can identify, the doctor can identify which portion of the heart has become infructuous means it is dead. So, that kind of a investigation can be done using radiopharmaceuticals labeled with proper 
the device stops. Similarly, you have this scintigraphic image of lutetium-177 labeled EGTMP in dogs which are were found to be having osteosarcoma. So you can see this is how you uh, keep the patient in the SPECT machine and you can see the inflammation. So that sarcoma, that the particular tumor in the, in the animal can be seen in bright intensity of the radiation. The radioisotope is going and uh, depositing there. So you can see that you can even the lecture 177 not only can do the diagnosis by means of gamma ray, you can also do the treatment because the therapeutic uh, application requires emission of high energy beta particles which lecture 177 emits. Now that was the SPECT imaging. So you use a single photon emitting radioisotope and you take the camera and it will take the image of the organ. But the resolutions in the SPECT are not very high and therefore the positron emission tomography P PET has become now more, more popular because of the resolution in terms of uh, the space. The spatial resolution is excellent in PET. And PET you require a positron emitter. The positron emitters are carbon-11, nitrogen-13, oxygen-15, fluorine-18 and also gallium-68. You can see their half-lives are minutes and the beta plus positron energy and the way they are produced. So F18 is in fact these days most commonly used because it is a, having a half-life of about two hours. So from the cyclotron they can be transported to the hospitals whereas the other, other isotopes carbon-11, nitrogen-13, oxygen-15, their half-lives are even less than 20 minutes. And so they require the cyclotron to be present in the hospital. So immediately you transport the, the pharmaceutical to the hospital within a few minutes and then you can do the PET analysis. But chlorine-18 you can take from cyclotron to other hospitals in the city. And another thing is gallium-68 is one another very interesting pair. It's a generator. You have germanium-68 decaying to gallium-68 and you can take the, you can take the generated to the hospital and we milk the, the gallium 68 which is then injected into the human body for pet investigations. So this is again the principle behind the positron emission tomography. So now you have a ring of detectors which is not single detector. You have a ring and the patient like MRI, it is like MRI. So the patient is made to lie here, this, the detectors encircle the patient. So suppose you have an organ here. It is odd shaped organ and then from different parts of this organ, the gamma rays, the, uh, the positrons, uh, positrons are anyway annihilated, so gamma rays are emitted and the 511 kV gamma ray, they are emitted at 180 degree, so you know the positron annihilation and so from a particular point, you will see that the two detectors will receive an event at 180 degree. So similarly, this event is this, these two events are coming from this place. So this because of the coincidence phenomena, you can identify from which place in the in the organ the the, the higher TV gamma ray has come. So this is a schematic. You have a, this is actually an annular one. This is a circle. It's a cylinder type of thing. And then this is the BGO detector, array, and it's a, like a circular array. And then this data are fed to the computer to do the you know investigation to compute to simulate the distribution of activity in the organ. So from it's a PET machine, it's a very compact machine, and in the cyclotron, the once you produce the positron emitter, you have to have the very fast chemistry. There's a radiochemical unit which will separate the radiochemical, and then you can label them and then transport to the hospital. So this is the general principle of the PET machine and the images that you get from the SPECT versus PET you can see this is the image of a brain using SPECT and PET. So you can see the marked difference improvement in the image of the brain using PET vis-a-vis the SPECT image. That is why now the SPECT is, PET is becoming very very popular among the nuclear medicine practitioners. Now let me come to the another application of radioisotopes is in therapy, therapy of cancer. And here there are three techniques. One of them is teletherapy. As the name itself implies, the radioisotope is from outside the body and you concentrate, the, you focus the beam of the gamma ray onto the organ that is to be irradiated. People use cobalt-60 source 
which is emitting high energy gamma ray 1.17 and 1.33 MeV and the gamma rays are focused onto the tumor so you have to put it in the proper shield and then allow only a beam of gamma ray to come though the gamma ray is emitted in all directions but you are collimating the gamma ray to come to a particular tumor so the, there is a huge activity required because you cannot focus the gamma ray only you can collimate so about 12 12000 curie of power 60 is used in one machine for this teletherapy so this is the uh, where the patient lies and the this is the, machine, the source cover so you can it is in that is sealed and the the, the, the gamma ray emitted is the, the, the cover 60 is emitting gamma ray to irradiate the particular or so though cover 60 is most commonly used there are now advancements going on you can produce gamma ray from electron beam by means of dimstalen you can use photons, protons for therapy and you can use boron neutron capture therapy that means you suppose you can you can you want to produce uh, protons you can have neutrons you can you can have a neutron source for treatment of the cancer so you use borons and the neutron will induce uh, the reaction in the boron and give you alpha and lithium 7 so this alpha and lithium 7 essentially what will happen So this alpha and lithium 7 are now highly charged particles, highly charged particles and they will damage the cancerous tissue. So you have to take boron labeled compound with that organ, nearby that organ and bombard with neutrons selectively because boron has very high cross section for neutrons. You can do the damage of cancerous cells by using this technique. So there are many techniques which are being used for cancer treatment. One of them is teletherapy, other one is brachytherapy. Not all uh, cancers can be treated by teletherapy because from outside you cannot take the gamma ray to a particular organ, particularly the deep suited tumors like cervical cancers, prostate cancers, ocular cancers, you know, eye, eye cancers. So these are deep seated, so you, you, you may unnecessarily damage the other organs. So the, those uh, tumors which are not amenable by teletherapy, they are treated by brachytherapy. In brachytherapy, you use tiny sources. They are placed in a cavity, which can be placed in a cavity and the particularly people use 192 iridium and 125 iodine. 125 iodine has a half-life of 60 days and gamma ray energy is 35 keV or so and 192 about 100 to 100 keV gamma rays. So you put the, the sources for a particular period of time and after that these are sealed sources. So they are not going to the blood bloodstream. You can just take them out after proper exposure. These are the typical, you know, this, this needle shaped pins source, they are source shield sources. They are called ocuprostra seeds because they can use for ocular cancer as well as prostate cancer. So they are they are made in the laboratories, and this is the typical drawing of the seed. You can see the length of this is 4.5 millimeter and the diameter is of the drop 0.8 mm. So very thin, tiny. Needles and wires look like wires, so they can be placed behind the eye yeah, and you can be placed in the other places of the human body. So, wherever you want to do the treatment, the prostate cancer, so you want to irradiate the post prostate with the, this gamma rays, you can do that. And then lastly, we have the radionuclide therapy. Radionuclide therapy is that like radio pharmaceuticals used for diagnosis. The, you can tag the radio pharmaceutical with a radioisotope which is emitting the particulate emission and then do therapy. So the pharmaceutical will take the radioisotope to a particular organ and the radioisotope will emit the particulate gamma, uh, particulate radiation alpha or beta and that will kill the tensor cell. So 131 iodine is used for thyroid disorders, yttrium 90 for treatment of arthritis and phosphorus 32 for skin cancer. Yttrium 90 and phosphorus 32 are pure beta emitters, the high energy beta is destroyed the tumor cells and so for example iodine uh, you can use the beta for thyroid disorders. So even for therapeutic agents you know for if you have some joint diseases like arthritis then there are uh, radioisotopes like yttrium 90, rbm 169, rhenium 186 they can be used for treatment of joint diseases. One of the examples you can see here Immediately after the treatment, the, the distribution of the, that you have the arthritis, you know, so there is some fluid deposition 
and that you can take the image of that uh, knee uh, with this radioisotopes. After three months of treatment or after six months of treatment, you can see that the patient is recovering, that particular inflammation is going off. So, this image is taken with yttrium 90 hydroxy appetite for treatment of arthritis. So, we can use this radioisotopes which are emitting particular radiation for treatment of many types of diseases. And lastly, there are theranostics means th therapy and diagnosis. So, they have dual purpose of not only doing therapy but also diagnosis. So, they are called, this is a new concept coming up last few years now. The radioisotopes having dual properties. So, they emit particular radiation like beta alpha and also they emit gamma radiation and therefore, they can be used for both diagnosis and therapy. So, for example, when a patient is undergoing iodine therapy, you can monitor the therapy, the, what is happening to the patient as a function of time using gamma ray emission. So, iodine-131 is one of the isotopes. It has got a beta minus and a gamma ray. And 177 lutetium is another isotope which has got a very good chemistry, ideal gamma ray energy 100 to 200 and half-life and particulate radiation. So, this is the image of uh, lutetium-177 hydroxy appetite which is used for treatment of arthritis in medium sized joints like elbow, wrist and ankle and you can see immediately after therapy and then after one month of the therapy how the inflammation is vanishing as a function of time. So this is how one can uh, carry out investigations of therapeutic applications of radioisotopes, you can do teletherapy, you can do back therapy and if you suppose there are it in the, in the tumor is in the glands sometimes even the brachytherapy may not help. So, you can go for radionuclide therapy and the theranostic ones help you not only in therapy but also in diagnosis as a function of time while the therapeutic treatment is going on. So, that's all I have to say in this particular one. The next lecture I will talk about the other applications of radioisotopes in industry and so on. Thank you very much.